Welcome to the Johnstone Supply Cafferty Group. Explanation of the D checker application with a fit and a VRV S. We'll do the RXTQ model and we'll take a look at uh, importing a TGZ file from the Bluetooth service checker as well. Hey, I'm squeezing in a little bit of audio here. Uh, some of the guys that assist with the videos aren't extremely technical, but they should do a great job helping me out. So if I miss something or make a mistake or you have a question or want clarification, something that got by us, feel free to email me at the end. You'll see the email. I'd be happy to clarify that. Now let's start by talking about the differences. Uh, here's a picture here. I took a picture of my wire. This is the D checker. Plugs in USB. And then we have the Bluetooth service checker. This will plug into the uh, piece of equipment, but go Bluetooth to a mobile device. And you'll connect using your phone or tablet. Either the recording done with the D checker or the Bluetooth service checker can be imported. Uh, and we can bring that into the uh, D checker software on the computer itself. Let me see, I got the software running here, but uh, we'll back up here a minute and I'll uh, uh, go to our web page and we'll download this. You can do a web search for DChecker 3. You can also just go to johnstonecafferdygroup.com and you see it auto filled, but I'm just going to type the whole thing out. That will redirect you to my uh, share site, FTP site over at Hightail. Uh, and it's redirected. And if we go down, we'll see quite a few files available. Those are the most popular requested files. Uh, and as we go down here, we'll see the uh, D checker toward the bottom. There's the D checker user manual available. Uh, you can download and review it. It shows you how to connect it. And you'll see if you come up, we'll also have the D checker software itself available to you. There's the setup file zip. Uh, if we go up a little more, we'll actually see some other files as well. We'll see the drivers, the zip files. And those, if you're going to run it and it does not see a COM port, Loaded on the computer, you'll need to load the zip file, download the zip files, and run them uh, so it has the proper drivers uh, inside the system. But once you get it going, we'll go to options and we'll see the COM port. If that's not visible when you plug it in uh, and not visible under your device manager, you'll have to load the extra drivers. Uh, we also have some other items. You'll load your, uh, in my case, pounds per square inch in Fahrenheit. I leave it on five seconds. I have plenty of memory. Leave it to manual stop. I don't worry about the uh, the graph settings. I'll go back and do those when I'm actually in the graph. But the service office and responsible person must be filled in or it's not going to let you continue. And you'll see I have my info filled in there. And once I have all that done and I've got the correct COM port chosen, if I want to connect, I can say OK. In this case, we're just going to play your import files and the COM port really won't make a difference uh, to what we do here. You'll see. I have a couple files on my desktop. I have the uh, the lab I brought over, but I also have a TGZ file. And you see if I go in and look at customers, that's the uh, zip file I would bring in us through, through the customer link. Uh, but first we're going to go to the uh, mobile data. Uh, let's say you sent one from your phone via email. You go to the TGV file and the TGZ for this one is just called fit. And I can go in and I can run it. Uh, I can also go into just my customer info. And when I click on my customer info, I'm going to be able to import a new customer. So I'll go down here and uh, we'll say import. And I'll go and find that lab and say open. Now it's already on my system. I'm going to say OK. It'll bring it over anyway. We'll just double click on it. And we'll see I happen to have one file. We could have multiple files. We can have up to 40 files. But in this case, I have one. And I can hit play and we can bring it up on the screen. This is what we're going to see when we hit play and we'll see a few things. We'll see it's one unit uh, with one head in this case and we might see more if it's on a multi or a mini split uh, or a VRV. Uh, but we'll also see the data file. We'll see the data file on the right there. This one happens to show it is the data file specifically for the DX17. Uh, and we have some other great videos. You can see how we're going to get that data off. Uh, we'll go to the chart and the chart's important. It's not that we want to use the chart right away, but we'll pick a timeline. And the timeline is going to show where we are on the graph. And if you look off to the right here, I'm missing a lot of data. And that's because there's a pulls of data every five seconds. Sometimes we just get a little bit of a hiccup. And you can see here I clicked and I'm missing a little bit. So I'm going to keep looking along my timeline till I can fill in all my data. And sometimes if I'm missing a spot that I'm not really concerned with, it doesn't really matter. Here we go. Here I have a spot where all the data came in smoothly. Uh, with maybe a few minutes of what's going on. In the top right, you see the error and protection mode. Neither one of those is lit, so I'm not really concerned with what's happening at this exact second, just an overall view of the unit. 
And we'll keep it on the graph for a moment. You can see the three gray bars I have over here on the on the uh, kind of the right of the graph. Uh, and that's where they're located. You see the check marks here on the left, and they're located in those sections one, two, and three of the legend. And if I move it over, you'll see we'll move that down to legend number two, and then I can move it back up. And it's too high, it's off the screen. I can't see what's going on. I'm not happy with the placement. I can actually change my legend. I can go in and we'll change this 100. We'll go ahead and make it a little larger. Uh, and I'll hit tab and then I'll click on my uh, screen and you'll see everything move down to the new setting for the legend. Uh, and if I'm using certain data that I choose to put on the screen, I can set the legend just for that specific data as I go along. I can also move it between legends on the left. Uh, if I go back to the cursor data, I see a few interesting things on the screen here. Uh, we'll see next to, if we look at the center, we'll see next to the name, uh, of course, a number. We'll see the 50s there in the center, and we'll see a 0, 1, 2, 3. That is the data inside of the chart, and I can turn those on and off, and we're going to do so in a minute. And next to it, you'll see a number 1, and that's the legend that's currently on. And we'll see an A for the analog portion of the screen, which is the upper portion, and a D is the, the digital, which is in the lower portion. So I'm going to go ahead and switch all of these off, because at this point, I'm very interested in maybe just monitoring the superheat subcool. Now with the computer connected with the wire, we can actually do the graphing while the unit's running live. Uh, you won't see the graph live on the Bluetooth service check or the mobile device, but we will on the playback. I'm not super concerned with the one I have there on digital that'll be on the lower part of the screen. I'm going to leave that on so uh, we can see what's going on there. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and choose my suction of my liquid, and if I look down, I'll also see my pressures uh, located on there. And if you can see these two located here, and we got our temperatures there on the left. We'll see where they're at. But I want to actually look at my superheat and subcool. So I will see my pressures on the right-hand side of the cursor data, but I'll also see the pressure with a T. And that T in parentheses is for the uh, temperature saturated. So I'll click on the low and the high both, and this is going to give us the saturation right off the chart. So now I can see on the chart here. Now the chart's not super linear, so when we look at the numbers on the left, we'll see maybe 18 and 18. Uh, but you'll see it looks a little wider on the way the chart's laid out. But as long as you know that, we can enter numbers and just get the proper data just on the screen that we want to monitor while it's running. And we can look for a difference. And if we see the uh, lines getting too close or too far apart, uh, any point you feel it's alarming, we can look over to the left there and get the actual data. And you'll see as I move along the timeline, we'll update the data. And when you're doing it live, it'll update every five seconds. It'll turn on and off. And we'll see the update. Uh, and this is a method to monitor the superheat and the subcool uh, as we're running the system. Uh, we'll see a small splice here or there. I didn't want to lose continuity, uh, but a lot of the data I did not have to have continue running. Uh, and we'll see here, I'm just uh, during the use as I'm recording this, I'm actually recording my screen. I want to really pay close attention to that spread between those numbers. It's not as large as you actually think. You'll have to actually look at the superheat and subcool as listed in the actual data. Uh, and just note that the chart script changes uh, may uh, just uh, be for you to watch closely and when you start seeing a swing to look back at the numbers. Uh, here I am, I'm moving things over. I'm actually changing the legend in column two and then if I move something over to column two, I'll click on the two things and hit apply changes and you can see I can put them in a whole separate column uh, if I'm not interested in looking at them very closely. And again, I'm going in the column two and uh, making some adjustments as well. Most often when we're working with the data, I'm just looking at the hard numbers and not so much the graph view, but the graph's important because I can move along the timeline. And you see I'm clicking here at the different times and the things are changing, but I can also keep an eye on that protection and the error on the top right there and see when an error appears. When the error does appear, that is the moment the, the unit seen an error. I can look at the data and the data that's producing the error. Uh, and again, back to the data, and we'll, we'll take a look at a few things here. Uh, we'll notice down below, uh, we do have the pulses. On a mini split, we'll see the pulses in the upper air. In this case, we're going to see the pulses of the indoor coil down below. And we might see some pulses up top uh, for the heat pump, although it's not in heat pump mode. Uh, it'll be wide open. Uh, don't be alarmed if we don't get all the numbers down below in the coil or the airflow. 
Uh, sometimes we won't get the airflow reported. In this case, it's on an MBVC, so I'm not going to get the airflow reported. On a furnace, it'll actually show me the airflow I'm getting uh, in that bottom right section. Uh, and some of the older coils don't pull the temperatures over. So on some of the new coils, we'll have it. And I think that's kind of more than a software revision than anything else. You can see here I updated it. I added my EV pulses. I want to watch my EV. Uh, on this fit unit, indoor coils, 480. Uh, most are 480 or many splits are 470 or 480. Uh, this one is going to be 480 and I'm going to monitor that to make sure I'm staying at I'll jolly 50 to 70 percent. So normally well I'll see it. And if I see it out of that range something is occurring I might want to keep an eye on. And you can see the pulses in the down area there at 232. So I'm a little under half and this is my lab unit. It's quite cool inside the room. Uh, it's kind of to be expected. Uh, the data I'm, I'm getting to show here very small line set and cool inside uh, we will have a uh, troubleshooting portion just on the fit uh, but the rest of the data you can see here use your common sense and troubleshooting discharge of the compressor uh, you know when you're low on charge you know what happens to the discharge and you can monitor the different items for here this allows you to measure every sensor every pressure all at one time and have it in front of you uh, to see approximately what's going on. It'll also show your protection modes on the left if you're in a startup control or oil return. Uh, let's go ahead and hit back and we're gonna, actually going to go in and uh, look at something different here. I'm actually going to go back and hit uh, my uh, customer info and we're going to go look at the lab again. And we're actually going to edit the lab so we can go into here and uh, either add new or edit and we'll edit and you can see we can add more information in here so that customer has very specific information if we have an address we might have six buildings on a certain address uh, let's go look at our, my other lab units i think i have a couple more here in a different application and uh, this would be dx17 as well uh, but this would be possibly with a gas furnace and when we look uh, we'll see I'm monitoring the compressor in this class. Uh, we're going over the compressor rotations and we can look at the data as well along that same timeline and we can see what's occurring. And we'll see now when we go down below we have a lot more data. We're using a gas furnace with a coil so we're pulling more data in the lower area. Uh, we're pulling in some pressures and temperatures uh, that we'll see more often. All right, let's go ahead and just take a look at uh, a VRV. I come in here and we'll do a VRV under graph view. Uh, and we'll see a few items, but what I want to really point out to you is I, those are the only ones I have turned on right now. But we go along the timeline and we'll go into the cursor data and we'll try and pull up some data. Uh, a few things here, you'll see I got external uh, expansion valves uh, in the outdoor unit as well as the indoor unit and they operate for different reasons on the commercial vrv we'll see up to seven i think expansion valves and some of the equipment uh mattering what we're doing with the equipment and you'll notice the indoor heads and what you really have to note when you touch your vrv is uh we'll look at the superheat and subcool that's always great to look at in your pressures but i want to look at the indoor ev pulses and you'll see these are 2000 pulses and uh so all three of these heads are open if I had one at zero, it would be an unopened head. And if that at zero, I should not see a temperature drop. And if I do, uh, it's robbing uh, some refrigerant cooling or some cooling effect from the other units. Uh, we can run the fan, look for delta T, and we should not have a delta T uh, when our EV shows zero. Otherwise, we know it's stuck open. Uh, if you pay close attention to a couple things, but let's go down and look at the temperature of the coil. Uh, VRV, mini split, all the same, 42 to 48 on that indoor coil. You see these are 46 across. The only way we're going to get uh, more cooling out of this is we tell the VRV to be 42. I think this one's programmed a little bit higher up because uh, we're looking at more of a sensible attack uh, and less latent mode. But uh, is to push more heat into it. So we speed the fan up and that 46 in a hot room will start rising and the EEV will open or the compressor will speed up if the EEV is wide open. And in this case, it is open. This is a, a startup here. We're not very far into the timeline. And after it runs for a while, we'll see the EVs back off and we'll maintain a temperature. Uh, and we'll look again. And uh, this one's important to show you because this was one where I logged onto it. And for some oddball reason, uh, this is what we ended up with. And I can look at the cursory data and nothing pulled over. And that's nothing alarming. Uh, those mistakes happen and I'll escape. And I'll usually log back in sometimes a few tries and then we'll get up to work.
Uh, this is a heat mode fit. I want you to be able to just to peek at some numbers and we'll go up and we'll open the data here. And then we'll see, uh, we'll find a spot along the uh, data line where we have data. Uh, and we'll go back to the cursor data, cursory data, and we'll see the indoor expansion valve at 480 wide open and the outdoor one is modulating. And this stays pretty wide open during a heat mode. Uh, pretty standard heat mode. You'll see in the top right actually says operation mode heating. Uh, and again, we'll see our, our pulses change. We'll see our pulses outside uh, be uh, modulating and the ones on the indoor be wide open. Uh, we'll also see the pressures of course change on the indoor uh, suction line as well. All right, you'll also see on VRV and FIT, usually on FIT, we'll see the demand percent on the left down below. Sometimes it comes in at zero. Uh, normally it will actually show your percent demand. I'm going to back out of this here. Uh, again, I hope that helped find your way around a little bit. A lot of data to throw at you at once. We'd be much more specific on some other videos. Uh, I wanted to give you an idea of the D checker. Again, you're welcome to uh, remember you can go to johnstonecaffertygroup.com and download the D checker software anytime you'd like, including the manual, and load it on your computer. Uh, see my email on the screen. If you uh, request a customer for me, I'll send some customer data where you can view. Uh, the fit just let me know if you want the fit or you want the uh mini split or a multi split or a vrv uh, and we'll even do a commercial vrv with the tgz file on a mobile device when using the uh, bluetooth service checker instead of the service checker you're going to see only the unit you're hooked to and up to uh, they believe it's 49 heads on the inside you will not see the daisy chained other outdoor units unless you're using a service checker